um, physician in the emergency department um, here at Children's National. Um, and I come to you as the co-chair of our uh, Social Determinants of Health um, Special Interest Group. And we're happy today to have um, Kenna Sheik, who is a pediatric hospitalist um, at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, she is a member of the Muscogee Creek and Cherokee Nations and has a special interest in Native American health. In addition, um, she is um, conducting a program called Collaborating to Optimize Parent Experience, which um, is investigating the best ways to incorporate um, parental social determinants of health into the overall uh, care of pediatric patients. Um, and we would like to thank her for being here today, Dr. Sheik. Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, so as was mentioned, so my name is Kenny Sheik. Um, I'm here at Cincinnati Children's. Um, I recently got started um, working with uh, Dr. Anita Shaw, um, who does a lot of work on um, ACEs as well as um, parental resilience. And together we've been working on this project just to try and increase um, screening on the inpatient unit. Um, so we're just gonna kind of go into a little bit of that. And some of this will be a, a lot of a kind of an overview of a lot of information you guys might've known, but please feel free to ask any questions throughout this. Um, I'm happy to take any questions during. So just kind of um, objectives, just a little bit of background work. I'm gonna talk about our COPE tool that we're using as well as our inpatient process. I'll do just kind of a brief overview of some of our positive screens um, as well as our current successes and barriers and then kind of our hopeful next steps. So parental adversity and resilience. Um, we know that um, parental adversity, um, based on some research that uh, Dr. Shaw has done before in the past, is that um, parental adverse childhood experiences and also resilience um, on coping um, affect discharges. So what they've seen before in the past and what they did was they actually surveyed over um, 1,300 parents during this time, and what they found out that many of our parents actually have ACEs um, of those of us of those parents who have children who are admitted to the inpatient unit. And what they found out was that about 45% of those parents actually have um, an ACE score between one and three, and about 19% um, of parents have um, ACEs of four or more. So they kind of chose more to use the four or more as their high risk group. Um, it, as in previous studies, um, this number was the for ACEs was associated with increased comorbidities in, adult, in adults. Um, and so what they also looked at was the effect of parental ch adverse childhood experiences as well as resilience on reutilization. So what they kind of found out through these studies was is that there was a high prevalence of both ACEs and resilience in parents of hospitalized children. Uh, parents with higher ACEs greater than four or lower resilience as well were more likely to have coping difficulty after discharge and were also more likely to utilize the healthcare system as well, especially within the um, 30 days from discharge. Um, one of the things when we're talking about ACEs, um, the thing that comes up is the pair of ACEs. And although the initial kind of focus that a lot of Dr. Shaw's work was on adverse childhood experiences, um, we know that um, a that's kind of a limited survey and doesn't assess the number of factors that like poverty, racism, and discrimination. So a lot of the focus kind of shifted rather from adverse child experiences to more of those adverse community environments, which also kind of gets us into our social determinants of health as well. So our social determinants of health, like a lot of us know, is the conditions in which um, people are born, grow, live, work, and age, um, shaping the conditions of daily life. And that includes childhood experiences, housing, education, employment, family income, communities, um, and so forth. And we also know that COVID, these last, now that we're in our junior year of the pandemic, um, COVID has greatly impacted not only us um, in the healthcare system, but a lot of our families as well. There's been a disruption of employment status for many of our families, um, more financial hardship. They've had exacerbated food insecurities with initially food closures, or excuse me, school closures earlier on, and then also with the disruption of um, employment. And then also limited social supports for some families, especially families who continue to um, try and isolate isolate or quarantine as much as they can to keep their kids um, safe and protected from COVID. So in the current context, we know that um, outpatient screening, um, especially based on these two studies down here below as well, has shown that it improves family access to resources. There's an adherence to preventative care, such as vaccinations, and also um, screening for social determinants of health have led to fewer future social needs and subsequent visits as well. 
Um, in the inpatient setting, current screening is lacking on the inpatient unit, um, and there have been some studies as well just to kind of look at um, going out and surveying providers in terms of how comfortable they are with screening for social determinants of health as well as um, what their knowledge base is and just kind of knowing overall it's lacking. I think this um, these last couple of years we've seen a lot more programs um, who are kind of taking that into consideration and starting to implement their own inpatient screening, um, talking to some groups um, even at your guys' institution as well as well as some other groups and other institutions. Um, it's been great to learn about um, all these different processes that everyone's working on just to try and increase screening of kids who are admitted to the inpatient unit because we know there are about um, a little over 6 million admissions each year. And a lot of these kids may not have um, good continuity with their primary care providers um, and may not be seen as often. So we have a good chance to intervene and intervene with families as well as children. Um, for us here at Cincinnati Children's, we previously did have an inpatient screening. This was more of nursing led during that time. This was before I started. Um, it was known as the pink sheet and a lot of our nurses knew it as a pink sheet as well. Um, had a few questions on social determinants of health, more about housing as well as concerns about utilities, transportation, um, concerns about um, anyone hurting anyone in the home and also food insecurity as well. During that time when they were screening, um, they also had utility resources, um, food resources, and other little cards that they could pass out to families and provide them support um, or consult social worker or care manager if needed. Um, during that time, they got up to about 40%, 47% of patients were screened um, at the peak of it, and then it kind of went away on its own. So um, based on a lot of the work that Anita had done um, previously, um, we created a team. So um, Anita Shaw and I are both team leads um, for this COPE project. And um, we also have a parent who's been involved with us uh, for quite some time in terms of developing our um, screening tool, as well as um, how we go about screening families and has continued to um, interact with us during all of our meetings and give us uh, feedback as well. We have multiple physicians and residents. We have um, nurses from the unit, as well as unit directors, social work, chaplain, child life, as well as our behavioral medicine and clinical psychology and sometimes we will um, ask them for help or maybe see patients or family members as well. So with this COPE tool that we built, um, a lot of this work that was done on the ACE, on ACEs, um, Dr. Shaw had done a lot of work in terms of asking family members in terms of the best way of asking questions and the best way to kind of approach a lot of these um, social determinants of health questions, because sometimes many providers, I think, feel that these questions can be invasive to families, um, but we need to know this as well if we're wanting to help these children and these parents. Um, so what initially starting off, um, we started off with a just kind of a an overview of what stress is as well as what stress looks like. And this is kind of the first page of our COPE tool that we have. Um, we also have a stress thermometer, and this is a validated tool um, that came out of um, an institution out in NYU. Um, it was initially used in the ICU um, where they more checked the level stress level of family members to kind of help them gauge how best they could help families in the PQ um, and support them the best way they could while their child was hospitalized and needing critical care. So we've continued to use this as well, just to kind of get a good idea of what family stress level is during this hospitalization and how best we can kind of help and also offers an opportunity just to talk about stress and what stress looks like for these families. Um, we also have um, several questions as well, which include things like transportation, food insecurity, um, caregiver depression, as well as housing situations. Um, because a lot of um, Dr. Shaw's initial work was done on resiliency, we also have questions about how well families um, tend to bounce back or they feel that they bounce back, what their support level is like. Um, we also ask families what their number one stressor is during that time, um, anything that we can do for help. And then we also give families a chance to um, specify if there's any services that they're needing help from. So we have things like child life, social work, chaplains, um, psychology, if they're needing language interpreters, concierge service, our family resources or family relation. And um, we also, oops, um, we have a resource sheet that I'll show here in a second. Um, based on how families respond to um, our surveys, we actually have a response algorithm as well, um, just to kind of help us and help our team members um, and other um, physicians or nurses on the unit know how to respond to response um, 
uh, various responses or positive screens. So if the thermometer scale is elevated, if they have concerns for transportation or food insecurity, depression or living situation, or even resilience, when do we get a support person in? And sometimes they'll just say support staff and we kind of leave this open for discussion with the families between the providers and family to discuss who is that appropriate person to get involved some of those times. Um, this is just an example of our family support services sheet that we have and just, just a portion of it, um, but includes some of the support services that we have available to families on the inpatient unit, as well as giving them a prompt of what some of these services actually provide as well. Um, so we've had some families who have um, chosen to get uh, chaplain involved or integrative health or even social work, um, just getting a better idea of what those services actually can provide to these families. Um, this is kind of an overview of our process map that we have. So um, once the patient arrives on the unit, um, we actually have staff introduce the COPE tool and the COPE tool is currently um, in placed in, the, in all the rooms of all the patients who are being admitted. Um, we have the, we inform the caregiver about the survey and the reason why we're doing it and then administer it. Um, the survey is then collected. Um, we then have um, our team members score this, the, uh, score the survey with the algorithm, check if there's resources needed and then reach out to the medical team asking for referrals making sure referrals are there um, in place. And then also the next step would be the uh, primary care team needs to put in and notify the PMD um, or put something in the discharge summary just to let them know that this is what family is screening positive for as well as anything that needs to be followed up or what resources were provided for this family as well. Um, just to kind of create that collaboration between our outpatient providers. Um, so just kind of a look at some of um, what our goals were and our hopes were and um, continue to work towards as well is our whole goal was to increase um, screening because by the time we started this, we were no longer screening using the previous pink sheet. So going up to about 70 percent, still have quite a bit of a ways to go. Um, some of our earlier um, intervention uh, things that we were working towards was working on employee engagement and buy-in as well as caregiver and family engagement and buy-in because without any of those, we can't get people to do our screens readily. Um, reliable process for administering the tool and algorithms, effective communication between our care teams, as well as efficient referral process, and then integration of our tool and workflow into EMR, which is something that is still ongoing we're working towards. Um, so this is just kind of where we are at currently. We've had a lot of ups and downs, and a lot of this has been related to um, different changes within our team, as well as higher census. And then with the COVID pandemic, um, just changes in census, as well as um, staffing as well. Um, we have had periods. Um, I will kind of go to the next one real quick here in just a second. Some of our interventions that we have done to try and increase the use of our tool, we translated our tool to Arabic and Spanish, and this also included the family resource sheet as well. Um, so those are available to families um, where nursing staff or um, our, oops, excuse me, our other providers can just go ahead and um, give an Arabic or um, Spanish one to our families who are in need of that. Um, we have readily available printed copies of the tool and resources so that no one's having to go around and looking for them or having to go print them on the unit. Um, we have an introduction um, or prompt to present the surveys, especially for providers who may not feel as comfortable talking about social determinants of health. Um, and we have a COPE team that um, has also been contacting primary care about any missed um, positive screens that have um, occurred as well, um, which is one of our biggest concerns is we don't want to um, screen these families and then um, not be able to provide them services, especially when they're in need of those services. Um, in terms of nursing and physician interventions, um, we've done a lot of education um, with um, residents as well as nurses on the unit. We've made videos and PowerPoint videos as well, just to kind of go over of how to screen um, and how to um, work through the algorithm and what resources to provide families as well. Um, Biweekly emails and newsletters just to encourage um, uptake um, of our screening tool, morning huddles as well. And then also created dot phrases um, just to kind of help out with our um, resident team to try and use the screening tool a little bit more within the system so that it's actually in the HMP or the um, discharge summary um, whenever patients are discharged. So looking at our some of our more positive screens that we've had recently, so we've been able to screen um, almost 450, 450 patients so far since we've started. Um, still have quite a bit of work to do. Um, the highest one has been our stress level. So many of our families, it's been about, this is about 45% of our families say that they have a stress level greater than five. And this is what we marked as a positive. Um, a lot of our families, when we do talk to them about their stress level, a lot of them just say, 
likely it's their, their child's sick, they're in the hospital, they're stressed, they don't want any support at the moment, they just want their child to get better. Um, where there's some other families who may have other um, concerns as well during that time. Um, food insecurity is a, um, one of our other higher ones, um, and we have a lot of work that's being done by um, um, Dr. Kathy Auger, who also is working on a lot of food insecurity on our inpatient unit as well. And so we've teamed up with her in terms of um, their project and their work that they're doing. Um, but most kind of a breakdown of food insecurity, um, food and in, we have a question about food in the hospital. So families are concerned about not being able to eat while they're in the inpatient unit or not being able to go out and get food. We have a question about that. So about 8% of our families have had concerns about getting hospital while they're in the food, concerns about hospital or food, excuse me, food running out um, while they're at home within the last month or so, about 14%, and then not having enough money to get more food, about 10% of those families. Um, we also have quite a high um, number of families who report that they have no resiliency um, or limited resiliency and need assistance with that as well. Um, and then the next one, excuse me, would be housing. Um, so about 5% of our families have said that they are worried about having a steady place to live or maybe don't have a steady place to live currently. And then um, quite a few more after that have actually reported problems of where they live. The majority of those included things like pests or mold, um, utility issues, maybe be, uh, leaks or ovens not working, um, and then a couple of them uh, worried about evictions as well. Um, so trying to provide support for those families as well during that time. Um, this is just, we talked about the number one stressor that family will put. This is just kind of word cloud of what many of those parents will actually write down on there. So this is just kind of their number one stressors of what they put. Um, majority of them just report that they're worried about their their sick child or worried about IVs, worried about, um, I think the other biggest one is um, either unemployment or missing work or worried about their other children as well. But um, just kind of um, interesting to see what family's biggest um, stressor is or biggest concerns they have while they're on the inpatient unit. So some of our successes, um, just to kind of share. Um, so we had a child that family scored here on this side is just their stress thermometer. Um, their number one stressor, they said, was their child being in the hospital. They did want help and requested child life um, just to keep their child busy. So helping this family out um, with child life is what they needed and were able to connect them. Um, another family who scored themselves a six to seven said doing, due to being in the hospital in situation with the patient, they want um, him to speak to psychology. So psychology got involved with this uh, family. Um, another family who also scored a six said due to stressors um, that were on previous pages, um, social work was consulted, um, requested by the RN to the resident. Um, they had positive screens for transportation as well as depression, and their number one stressor was decreased income, um, child was admitted to the hospital for a few days. And then they also requested a concierge service and also family resource center as well, just to kind of help the family out. Um, other ones, families with uh, less stress just reported that their biggest stress was making progress in the child's condition. They said the entire team was doing great and they had no concerns. Um, they would love a chair massage after sleeping on the terrible couches for several nights. So holistic health was referred and family asked for holistic health. Um, and then another family just reported that um, that they don't regarding the stress score that they 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 do have stress, but they know how to deal with it. And they know where their hope comes from. Um, they appreciated the work everyone was doing, and they also were appreciative of having this information and knowing what resources were available to them as well. And thought this um, our survey was helpful to them. Um, some of the we solicited some feedback from our nursing staff as well as our um, physicians and residents who were doing a lot of this and some of the feedback that we've received um, from them is mainly just improved um, patient provider relationship with our screening tool, um, especially more with the uh, stress thermometer as well. Um, they felt like kind of presenting a little bit of this and talking about stress and just opening it up for discussion has kind of helped improve some of that patient provider relationship. Also, um, getting a sense of idea about um, just the stresses inside or outside of the hospital. Um, also being able to identify parent needs earlier on in admission was also very helpful and they felt like it helped kind of move things along so that they could identify needs as soon as patients kind of came into the door um, and then weren't having to wait or kind of stumble upon everything as soon as they're trying to arrange for discharge at the end of everything as well. Um, some of our biggest barriers that we've um, faced right now is um, we're still in a, we still have a paper form. Um, so we've had quite a few incomplete forms from families, um, as well as a delay in form submissions, whether or not um, 
someone is holding onto the form for a little bit, or it might get lost, kind of put somewhere else initially before it gets put in with the rest of the pile for us to review as well. Um, we have recently started to try and do iPad screening. Um, still, again, we have some family members who just completely skip over questions, whether or not that's intentional or unintentional. We do have the option for family to opt out um, or say um, no concerns or don't want to answer. Um, the other thing is integrating into the workflow. So I think that the biggest barrier has been integrating into nursing as well as physicians. They are very different workflows for both of these um, two groups and trying to find something that can either balance between the two um, or will work better for one. Um, so Previously, we had some limited buy-in with the nursing, and I think right now, too, the biggest thing is just um, current staffing as well as patient volumes being one of our biggest issues right now, too, um, and trying to figure out the best way to train um, everyone who's on the unit or inform them about um, how we are doing this screening tool. Um, with the different workflows as well, um, some of the things we're working for uh, toward is how we integrate this into the EMR to make sure that everyone can see it and everyone's aware of it at the same time, because especially with our paper tool that we have, um, it's hard for the whole team to know exactly what was positive unless that communication is there and consistently there between all the different teams and sometimes that gets lost. Um, so trying to make sure that we get something in the EMR where everyone can see it and our hope is too is that with the EMR, not just the people who are on the inpatient unit, but also other providers as well on the outpatient side can be able to see that. Um, the other thing is just identifying positive screens as well. With all of our education we've done, we've had some families who, um, whether or not the person who was initially screening didn't recognize that it was a positive screen. And so having to kind of go back and communicate with primary care providers or catching the patient before they um, leave that this was a positive screen and families needing assistance. Um, the other thing is too, is just missed referrals before discharge. We have a lot of uh, patients who come in um, pretty quickly in our discharge, maybe within less than 24 hours or so, and they may actually have a positive. Um, by the time the team was notified that there was a positive, the discharge orders were already in and patient was about to walk out of the room. Um, so we've had to have conversations with um, primary care providers during that time just to discuss this was a positive, can you follow up during your next appointment? Um, and if this is still a concern, they may need some more resources or seeing if this is something more reasonable that we need to keep them here longer to help provide those resources for this family. Um, so the kind of big next steps for us is continue to identify some of our barriers with some of our earlier adopters. Um, improving communication between our multidisciplinary teams as well, um, whether that's between our nursing and residents or between um, our teams as well as social work and our BMCP or child life. I think that there's a lot of times whenever we're letting families know that we're, um, or sorry, when we're letting our um, teams know that we are wanting a consult from social work. A lot of times it doesn't come out that it's because of this COPE screening. So it's sometimes hard for us when we go back through our chart review to actually identify if it was because of the screen or maybe some other need that kind of came up during that time or was identified. Um, and then integration into the um, EMR as well as the use of the dot phrase. So one of the big things that's um, happening with EPIC that we've been working towards is the social determinants of health will. Um, ours is under a longitudinal, longitude, longitudinal plan of care column, um, but this is kind of what the social determinants of health will looks like. It has a lot of those questions and actually some more that um, we don't currently have on our screen. Um, there's a lot of work that's kind of going on in, in, at an institutional level to kind of standardize all the questions that everyone is using throughout all the different units so that we can kind of all come together and only use one screen um, and that everyone will hopefully kind of plug into this um, will. The other nice thing about this is that when a patient comes in for their follow-up appointment, whether it's with pulmonary or endocrine, um, or they come in for a new admission, or if they're coming into the ED, or maybe even seen by their primary care and they have EPIC access, they can actually see this will as well. When the last time they were screened, what families were positive for, and if they actually had, um, if they received resources or didn't receive resources as well. Um, and this is, I think, our biggest goal to kind of work towards as well, um, because anyone can kind of um, log that information in there, but making it kind of a priority for everyone to kind of pop up for them. Um, and just kind of the other view of that one as well.